1980, the sun comes up. My eyes open. Uh Uh-oh, I've woken up again. The bed smells bad, but it smells like home. It smells like a refuge. It's the way the sheets seem to crumble and disperse in tiny particles against my skin that's irritating. And then there's the morning light. Strictly on schedule, empty, smug, and so fucking ugly. It's like a prison guard. It's infuriating, and that makes me tired all over again. But here I am, waking up. I know what the problem is. I've gotten so skinny there's no distance between my nerve ends and my brain and everything has too much impact. All that flooding light out there. The day is like a big ocean pressing its moronic face against the windows and walls of my lost apartment and here I am, alone. I'm sunk. I turn my head back into the pillow and get a whiff of my armpits. Oh no. uh, Of course I knew it anyway, I've known it all along. But up it comes like a fragment of a dream from just a little haunted feeling, suddenly recalled, enlightening, like the snap of realization that what's different in the house is that something's burning, the sharp chemical metallic smell that sweat glands make when they're deprived of heroin. It's spring. I can't stop thinking. Spring has a smell to it, too, even in New York. It's the exhaust fumes mixed with the wet air, hints of sea air and foliage that still carry subtle promises of voyage and growth, It smells like just-cooked junk. I think of the crowds out there swarming over the streets with their minds clicking and buzzing and yawning with big hopes and schedules and breakfast table slights and anticipations of the boss's reactions, and my mind goes blank the way it does when a mathematical problem gets too complicated. I don't get it. I can't reach the strands. I push the covers off. I'm alone, and I think that's one good thing about dope. It keeps you conscious that you're alone. Suddenly I want to cry. I get up naked and in the same motion lift my thick biker's belt from the doorknob beside the bed and slip along the wall into the living room to avoid being seen through the living room window. I pull loose the loop of string that holds a roll of tattered bamboo halfway up the window and the shade falls with a sharp clatter like a pang of guilt gone in a second. I hang the belt over the back of a chair in front of the couch and go into the kitchen where I fill a glass with water and grab a handful of toilet paper. Back in the living room, I put the paper and water glass on the chair and get my spoon and syringe from a hidden drawer in the table opposite the couch. The spot where I sit on the couch is permanently dented by my weight and radiates a broken fringe of cigarette burns. The spoon, which is black with carbon on the underside, holds a crusty piece of cotton in the middle of a brown stain, the last shot from last night. I suck up some water from the glass with the syringe and squirt it into the spoon. Using the tip of the needle, I loosen the cotton and swirl it in the murky liquid to dissolve every last encrusted grain. I light a cluster of five or six paper matches and hold it under the spoon. Get it sterile. Make sure it all dissolves. It bubbles. A wisp of steam arises. It clarifies. Everything is focused there. I pull the fluid into the syringe through the filter, press the tube free of air bubbles, tighten the belt around my left bicep and slide the needle into the main vein of the forearm. I push the plunger out with my thumbnail and a thread of blood appears in the liquid. A hit. I loosen the belt. I press the plunger in and yank the needle out. Fuck. Hardly feel a thing. Still, I've usefully killed five minutes. Now what? I erase with the tissue the indifferent bulblet of black-red blood from my badly scarred forearm. I sit here. I look around. My apartment's like a cave. When I was a kid in Kentucky, we used to go cave hunting. There are lots of caves there. We'd take candles and sandwiches and flashlights and go exploring, get really muddy, find tiny animal skulls and salamanders. We'd make a fire and cook up plans to run away and hide in the caves, live there, and only appear to civilization as guerrilla marauders like Jesse James, popping up like hallucinations in supermarkets and raiding unlocked kitchens to pocket some bread and bologna and batteries running through backyards, caught only for flashes and peripheral vision, escaping back to our dark and soaking hideouts. I remember there was nothing worse than getting stuck, though. The main object of every cave exploration was to find a cavern as big as a room. We never did, but you never knew what a tunnel might lead to. That was the excitement. You'd push yourself inch by inch, crawling, timeless, inch diving through rock on your belly, squirming and squeezing in the chilly darkness, sweat and cave water dripping in your eyes, sharp stones scraping the back of your head, in hopes that the passage would open up like a castle. And then you'd find that you'd pushed yourself in so far that you not only couldn't go further, but you couldn't go back. You were wrapped in rock and trapped. 
claustrophobic panic would rise like gigantic internal missiles and then either explode or fall down dead. Sometimes the muscle rockets would blow you far enough backwards to get free. Sometimes you gave up, and that was great for a minute or two, dreaming of rot and revenge with your face in the tiny rivulets, love-lorn jewels inside your eyelids. Then the fear and desperation would kick in again. Never thought of that. I reached for a notebook to note the similarities between past and present. I need to piss. Just got off and I need to piss. That's bad. It means I'll be sick again inside of two hours. I put away the works. I take a piss and then go into the bedroom and pull on a pair of jockey shorts and a skin-tight pair of black Levi's that have a couple of nice brown-rimmed holes in the thighs where I hung them too long to dry in the oven one night when I had to play a gig. I button on a tight striped shirt with short frayed cut-off sleeves and pull on a good thick pair of socks that smell all right. Then I carry the phone from beside my bed back into the living room and put it down beside my spot on the couch. I sit there. I sit there. There's my dick inside my pants, really warm and heavy and potent. Maybe I should jerk off. I haven't come in days. It's like pissing or taking a shit. You can only do it between highs. The dust is falling. The skeleton pulls out his dick. Whoa, the pleasure, like piercing shards, like pieces of triangles skimming, banging around in your body. Whoa, God, it happens fast when you're straight. Floods of it, and it's practically a convulsion, a little epileptic fit. You almost see stars, but then it's gone, and all that's happened is you're a little emptier, too alert and skin bare to even drift in the sweetness for more than a minute, satisfied by slightness, as if you'd eaten too much popcorn. I pull my pants back up and let the feeling wash through me for its allotted time. The sun is really up now. All the window coverings in the house are off, and I feel overlit. The day is making its demands. Who should I call? Is everybody burnout? out? There's always ten dollars somewhere. There's always twenty dollars. Do I have any books worth selling? Should I pawn my guitar again? That's always an option. It feels a little chilly in here. The spring's the coldest season because the temperature hovers around the level where the slumlords are legally required to turn on the heat and they exploit it for all they're worth. Ring. All right, my charm's intact. This has to mean at least ten dollars. Anyone who'd call me at this hour must know what they're in for. It's Chrissa. This is a little delicate. Our relationship is supposed to run deeper than is convenient at a moment like this. Still, I know she's solvent and wants me to be her friend. Chrissa, I was just thinking about you. You were? That's nice. It is? It is. It is. What were you calling about? To remind you we were meeting Jack? Oh shit, I totally forgot. I wanted to remind you, you don't have anything to worry about. Jack thinks you're great. He has big plans for you. Yeah, but I don't feel too good today. What's wrong? Well, you know, I don't feel too well, and I'm flat broke. My refrigerator's a ghost town. It's fucking demoralizing. I just woke up feeling like this, goddammit, and I'm out of ideas. You're hungry? Well, I'm a little hungry. There's some oatmeal. I'm not going to starve, but another day like this? What? I'm out of books to sell. I don't want to pawn my guitar again. I got rehearsal later, and now that Jay down the hall is on the road, it's, it'll be hard to find one to borrow. Oh. I'm getting a royalty check from my lawyer next week, but he doesn't give advances. Listen, Chrissa, I'm sorry to lay this on you out of nowhere first thing in the morning, but do you think you could lend me 20 bucks till I get that bread from my lawyer? I feel like an inflatable clown teetering. My fate pathetic loser or lovable poor artist is balanced in the tone of her reply. All right, but you're going to be good with Jack, right? This is important. I will. I'll be in top form. I'm going to make it up to you someday, Chrissa. Suddenly, I remember it would be really nice to have something to eat, too. But listen, actually, do you think you could make it 25? Because I have a little debt to pay back, too. Okay, but you have to come over here now because I'm going out. I'll be there right away. I hang up feeling great and slimy at the same time. But soon enough, the searing light of my unfailing luck chars the slime to a thin, thin crust. I shrug and stretch. It flakes away, and I'm innocent again. Another eight hours arranged for.
after Christmas. I don't like being outside. I'm afraid there'll be a loud noise and I'll jump. I think how I've lived here so long, nothing looks new and interesting anymore. It's hard to find a route where I won't be likely to run into someone I know and realize that they're worried that I'm crazy because of the way I try to force myself to look into their eyes in order to show that I'm not crazy, and then I have to make an abrupt excuse that makes me seem even crazier and move off fast. I'm a machine that's set to skim, power walk to that doorway, collect, and move on to the next. I feel pretty good. It's nice to be seeing Krissa, too. I haven't seen much of her for a while. Someday I'll make it up to her, show her how completely I love her, and something strictly material right away when I get paid. Like, um, a champagne and caviar dinner. Or better yet, a trip to the country with me. I know we could still have a really sweet and sexy night together. I love her breasts. I love her ass. Her butt. Her rear end. There's no good word for that place. I'd like to ski off it. Or would she laugh me away? Just thinking about it makes me feel cute. I hate it when she makes me feel cute. She knows me too well. I've had to apologize too often. I've confessed too much and made the wrong confessions. She's seen my resolve fail too many times. Why am I going on like this? Am I a broken man? I laugh and a passerby glances at me and instantly looks away. Springtime, not hot enough for the garbage to smell. These old people with their dogs are ridiculous. How could someone let himself get old and wander around with a flea-bit hound on this vicious battleground? Well, they're just wallpaper to me, but this existence needs some redecoration. Then again, nothing ever changes. I can just imagine I'm a time traveler and it all becomes interesting again. Where am I? I walk down 10th Street where proud Puerto Ricans, after all, they've survived to be teenagers and are making money at a good clip, exchange little ticket-sized envelopes of marijuana for five dollars. Out in the sun like that, the money always looks like it has a silver patina you could smudge with a thumb as if it were magic, and if everybody would stop pretending, the stuff would just disintegrate. I remember having a little epiphany, a little insight into the timeless state of things once when I was walking alone on 14th Street, where everything looks medieval anyway. Everyone seemed to be like a manifestation of the Earth's possibilities, as each one of us another something spoken by the world. Now, though, it seems like the race is nearing its death, and it's going to realize that its efforts to fathom the universe and fulfill itself the patterns it has created in striving for knowledge, beauty, and harmony, riches, and world domination, all merely add up to a self-portrait, and it's an ugly, brutal, selfish face. The more lines that are added to the face of the earth, the more detailed and clear the subject of the portrait becomes as we near our finish, and soon the world will erase us and return to the drawing board. Maybe dinosaurs will get another chance. Chrisa lives on the top floor of a building on St. Mark's Place. It shocks me mildly to see how I can resent her for forcing me to climb seven flights of stairs to borrow $23 from her. I get up there, and she's sitting in the middle of the floor, thumbing through a single-drawer file cabinet. A glance at her does two things to me. It makes me glad to be alive, and makes me feel left behind and shut out of life altogether. Damn, damn, damn. I hate this real life. I prefer my mental life, where Chris and I are together forever, the moment we locked eyes, seven years ago. How did I get to be old enough to say seven years ago? If I can get to 30, I can get to 40. I've been wondering about this. Hi, Krissa. What you doing? I'm looking for some pictures for a job I got. Oh, you know, I was just thinking about something. I read somewhere recently that the Greeks thought of the past as being ahead of them and the future behind. You know, because the past is what you actually see. It's what your eyes are open to. Whereas the future, it's wherever your back is turned. And anyway, it's mostly made out of the past. Kind of comforting, don't you think? Yes, I know you'd really like to put your future behind you. Don't be mean now. Don't be cruel. There's your money over there. I know you're in a hurry. You know, those Greeks, how do they get to be so philosophical? It must be because they made up the word. But gee, it seems like they saw the big picture all the time. It must have been because of their gods, when all we have are movie stars. See, their gods were like people, while we've degenerated into treating people like gods. Can you imagine if Liza Minnelli or Al Green or Clint Eastwood could turn you into a duck? That would make you philosophical. She starts laughing. Wow, that's good luck. I still have a little juice. 
I can get out of here on a good note. I love to make her laugh. It makes me love her all over again. But this is just a stop in my dope run, and to whatever degree she knows or acknowledges she knows that, it's enough to make her despise me a little with regret. This flaw in the moment is like a secret vanity of mine she's discovered, as if she's caught me posing in the mirror, kissing myself, and it only makes me want to leave sooner. I'd be a duck for Al Green, she says, but our god of the moment is named Jack, and for some twisted reason of his own, he has a special fondness for you, which for all our sakes I hope you appreciate. I don't know how many more chances you're going to get. I admit, you always seem able to find another one, but I'm involved in this too. She sure can get cold. She isn't giving me an inch. Well, it's only sensible. I pick up the money. See you, I say, and then, I'm going to come through, Krissa. I know you're right. Whatever this plan Jack has, if you think it's so interesting, it must be worthwhile. I'll be there today, and I'll be in good shape. I make her stand up and hug me before I leave. Back to the street, where I am king, lord of the garbage. I go to cop. Copping is about as interesting as waiting for a subway train. Nothing good can happen. There's never a pleasant surprise. It's just a monotony that always has the potential of turning into something worse. I go on automatic again, pacing the most efficient route at a steady high speed sufficient to discourage all but the stupidest or craziest passers-by from thinking they might be free to detain me. I'm on important business. I know how to walk mean, with an expression of intimidating determination that's by you before you've recovered enough to jump it, friend or foe. I cop the dope and the trip home is a breeze. I am set free. Nothing can shake me except for the reflexive anxiety that pushes my fingers into the watch pocket of my jeans every couple of blocks to make sure the bags can't get dislodged. I feel like school is out. There is nothing else in the world I need. I leap up the stairs to my apartment and have my shirt off before I get to the living room. I assemble my paraphernalia with a speed, precision of movement, and conservation of energy the equal of the finest mystic craftsmen of old, a tea ceremony of sorts. In a moment, I'm high. The silence and inching shadows in my room are very beautiful and resonant with heroin. All anxiety dissolved. My writhing ceases. I am competent. I am good. I'm in tune. I have my notebook beside me, a 16-ounce bottle of Coke, and a bag of peanuts. I'm a ticker tape machine of poetry, an acrobat of spiritual language who even feigns slips for the hair-raising grace and hilarity of my recoveries for God alone. God being all the dead poets, all and everything. The watcher who grows in branches and forgives me while hoping for the best. Me dreaming the world in my own image, where it radiates from my empty room where I'm alone and happy. I pick up a magazine, and by total coincidence, one sees what one is alert to, read, There is no I, there is only God. It is he who glistens on the ocean surface amid the orange groves. The heady fragrance is also he, and so is the wind, the snake, the shark, the wine. Do not see yourself as yet another dream. Go on dreaming yourself. The guy must be Mediterranean, somewhat over-biblical, plus he's a little short in the shark department. But that last line has a good twist. I set to dreaming. I shake my head and the tiny acrobats fall like spangles, like the cool rain on another planet, down to the inside of my feet. I have to pull myself together. It's almost time to meet Jack. <laughs>